Hello and welcome to Advocate, a podcast channel by ASEAN Parliamentarians for Human Rights, or APHR. On this channel, we're delving into some of the most important human rights and democracy issues affecting Southeast Asia. And if you like what you hear, please check out our two earlier series, Parliamentarians at Risk and ASEAN's Recurrent Crisis. My name is Oliver Slow, and I'm APHR's Media and Communications Officer. Welcome to our new series, Myanmar, Anatomy of a Coup, and Episode 3, Resisting the Coup. This series takes a close look at the major players in Myanmar's current environment. Speaking with a broad range of people, both inside and outside the country, we aim to better understand these actors' mindsets, interests and motivations, with a view to identifying measures that the international community, including those here in Southeast Asia and further afield, can take to put an end to the military's chaotic and violent rule and ensure that democracy and the will of the people prevail. In the first two episodes, we took a deep dive look at the Myanmar military, the Tatmadaw, to better understand a few things about them, namely how they operate, how they view themselves as the sole protectors of the nation, and how they fund their operations. We also looked at the historic and systematic violence they have subjected the Myanmar people to for several decades. This time around, we'll hear from the many people, up and down the country, who have risen up against the military since its February 1 putsch. This includes human rights defenders, journalists, politicians, as well as members of the widespread civil disobedience movement. We'll speak with them to better understand why so many people across Myanmar are willing to risk their lives to bring an end to the military rule in the country, as well as what actions they hope to see taken by the international community. Thanks for listening. A few nights after the military launched its coup in February, dozens of Yangon residents gathered in the city's downtown area, where they held aloft candles and sang a rendition of the revolutionary song, Kaba Ma Che Bu, or in English, Until the End of the World. The song opens with the lyrics, We will hold a grudge until the world ends. The history ridden with our blood. Revolution. Those who lost their lives in the battle for democracy are our dear heroes. In case it isn't clear, the Myanmar version has been adapted from the classic 1977 Kansas song, Dust in the Wind. This rendition was first recorded around the time of the huge anti-government protests that swept the country in 1988 and became emblematic of the country's pro-democracy movement. Given developments in Myanmar over the last few months, it remains as pertinent as it was when it was first recorded and is now an important symbol of the resistance movement. That powerful sing-along in downtown Yangon was one of the first demonstrations against the military after its power grab, which crushed a decade of democratic reforms and plunged the country back into the darkness of junta rule. But the military had underestimated the people's desire for democracy, and public demonstrations against the military regime have since continued unabated and have taken many forms. In the first few days of the protest, people showed their opposition to the coup by loudly banging pots and pans, a traditional way of driving out evil spirits in Myanmar. There have also been months of daily protests in cities, towns and villages up and down the country. A civil disobedience movement and general strike that is making the country ungovernable for the coup makers and now a parallel government that is aiming to gain international legitimacy. Journalists, both citizen and professional, across the country have also been working under extreme dangers to document the security forces atrocities. We'll meet all of these actors throughout this episode, but before we do, we think it's important to go back a little and take a look at how resistance against military rule emerged in Myanmar. A major moment in all of this was, of course, 1988. By this point, the military had sealed Myanmar, or Burma as it was then known, off from the outside world for more than two and a half decades. And although there were a handful of protests in the years prior, the 1988 uprising was the first time widespread displeasure at the military had spread throughout the country. The 1988 protest was started by students, particularly those from the Rangoon Institute of Technology, or RIT, and Rangoon University. And a major escalation occurred after a student, Kopon Moore, was killed by riot police at the RIT campus in northern Rangoon on March 13, 1988. Three days later, students from Rangoon University began a march to the RIT campus as a sign of solidarity with their fellow students. 
However, as the hundreds of students made their way north along the western banks of the city's Inya Lake, at a bus stop known at the time as White Bridge, they were hemmed in by soldiers and police. Kin Omar, at the time a student at Rangoon University, was among this group. I was one of those uh, student um, organisers of the 1988 uh, Nationwide Pro-Democracy Uprising. Uh, I said one of the organisers because there were many organisers, many of us, you know, because it was a, a cross-country organising. And uh, we didn't have phone, let alone social media or Facebook. No smartphones, you know, not even the home phones, you know, landline phones. So it was uh, quite an experience of organising, you know, in that time. I became involved in the earlier stage of the 1888 uprising. To be precise, it was on March 16th that I joined first demonstration with the fellow students. I was not at the front line, I was in the middle. I have many in the back and many at, in front of me. So actually by that time, I got this, uh, separated from my friends and none of them were with me anymore. I mean, the students in front of me were passing you know, the, the words from the uh, front line where the, the, the friends at the front rows were telling that's army uh, blocked. And then uh, they were negotiating to give us a way out, but we didn't get that. But then, like, you know, we kept waiting and waiting. I think it was past uh, already 3, 4 p.m. kind of time. And then uh, the, 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 the police uh, trucks, the rail police uh, trucks were driving towards us. So the police uh, uh, trucks were uh, driving in towards us. And then once they, they drove in, they just started um, using the... They just started using the, the tear gas, throwing at the uh, at us with the tear gas, and then coming out coming down with the uh, batons and you know shields and. But we were all like you know like uh, we were all uh, we were all calling out to each other, don't run, don't run, let's not run, let's not run. But you know the reality is we were so young and 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 we never experienced anything like that. I mean, my it was my first time ever, you know, in such moments. Kinoma and others escaped over the walls into a nearby residential compound. But not all of those protesting were so lucky. An unknown number of students were killed by soldiers and police. And there was so much blood on the ground at the White Bridge bus stop that the crackdown is remembered today as the Red Bridge incident. Word of the authorities' brutality against peaceful protesters quickly spread throughout the city. And the incident contributed heavily to the growing protest movement around the country, which reached their crescendo in the August, with thousands conducting strikes and demonstrations nationwide. It was also a major personal turning point for Kinoma. I mean, like, it, it changed my life forever. My life destination all changed, you know. Like, for me, from that night on, nothing more important in my life than bringing the justice and bringing human rights and democracy to our country. Because I asked the question that night, you know, I came back shaken. Seriously, like, literally shaken. And then I couldn't sleep and I, I, I kept asking that one question. Just one question. What kind of monsters? What kind of monsters will act such inhumane acts against us? The unarmed young students who are to be the, the future leaders of, who are the, the future leaders of our country. The 1988 movement would eventually be quelled by the authorities, but it did lay the groundwork for a pro-democracy movement in the country, as well as the emergence of civil society groups. It's, it's really hard to say, did, did we have a civil society? What kind of definition that we would take? I mean, of course, there were such and such, you know, like uh, literature groups uh, in our university, like the Mon Literature Group or the Shan Literature Group or, you know, like uh, uh, social welfare or social associations here and there. These are all not really, um, I wouldn't say that uh, as an independent, vibrant, white-space civil society. Although the increasingly repressive rule of the military made it difficult for civil society groups to properly organise in the country's heartlands, this period saw a huge growth in groups operating at the country's border areas. The 1990s saw the formation of groups working for the rights of ethnic minorities, including the Chin Human Rights Organisation, Karen Human Rights Group and the Shan Women's Action Network, among others. 1988 also paved the way for the emergence of a political opposition in the country's centre for the first time most notably in the form of the National League for Democracy, or NLD, which was established in September 1988 to run an election that the military promise would take place two years later. 
to the surprise of many, the nationwide vote did go ahead. And although the NLD won resoundingly, the military effectively made the election result null and void, jailed the party's leaders for decades and banned it from politics. Decades later, political prisoners were released in line with the reforms that began in 2011, and the NLD entered Parliament for the first time, following a by-election in 2012. A former MP with the NLD, who requested anonymity, spoke about why they joined the NLD ahead of the 2015 election. As requested by them, we've changed their voice to protect their identity. When uh, I decided to enter to uh, politics, uh, the NLD is the most significant party, and also the people are supporting it. And as a student, uh, I continuously support uh, the NLD. So I think NLD will win and we can do something for the people. The NLD did of course resoundingly win that 2015 election, taking almost 80% of the available seats. I would like to help the institutional strong and constitutional reform and, and uh, democracy. Uh, we would like to have a deeper democracy in the country. So I actively participate in the, like, the human rights uh, issue. The NLD, however, faced considerable criticism during its time in office, in particular from ethnic minorities, who say it continued with the Burma-centric policies of the Myanmar military. Most notably, the NLD, and Aung San Suu Kyi in particular, were criticised for failing to stand up for the Rohingya minority in Rakhine State. Here's Ken Omar again. The reality is... The NLD is the largest political party, but I think the, 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 the challenge that the ethnic communities have is because the NLD party policy when it comes to the ethnic equality or the federal democracy, there are shortfalls. There are shortfalls. It could be their understanding, it could be their vision, it could be their strategy, probably that they don't know what Aung San Suu Kyi is doing. You know, like they are on the same page when it comes to abolishing the 2008 constitution because that is the, the, the collective vision of the people anyway. That the NLD performance in the five years when it comes to peace, when it comes to the ethnic equality, when it comes to be reaching out to and forming alliance with the ethnic political parties, there was so much shortfalls in, from the NLD side. And you know, like on top of that, some of the NLD actions are actually in line with the military. They are in line with the military in terms of supporting the permanization, such as like, you know, bringing the General Aung San statue into the ethnic areas or naming the uh, uh, different landmarks in the ethnic areas with General Aung San's name. Kin Omar is referring to a policy driven by the NLD to build statues of General Aung San, who is Aung San Suu Kyi's father, in ethnic minority areas. Many of these groups feel that their own heroes have long been ignored in Myanmar's history and viewed this policy as yet another example of Burmanization, which we heard about in the previous episode. In a press conference hosted by APHR in April, Noor Susanna La La So, who was an NLD MP and now a ministerial member of the National Unity Government, apologised for many of the party's past mistakes. Yes, I would like to admit that in the last government, we are not doing very well on the human rights issue and neglecting some of the voice from the ethnic area. So I, by myself, personally apologize for that because I have been in uh, parliament for five years. So as a member of parliament, I don't have voice. I don't raise the voice for our brother and sister from the ethnic area, including Rohingyas, brother and sister. i really sorry for that. As in my statement, we would like to form from the beginning without discrimination, with unity, and full of human rights society. So this is what we would like to do in the future. Yes, we have the mistake in the past, we would like to open the new chapter in the future. Another key actor in the campaign to overthrow the junta has been the media. Up and down the country, journalists have captured footage, mainly on mobile phones, 
of the military's atrocities against the people. Sonny Sui is the co-founder and CEO of independent outlet Frontier Myanmar. He co-founded the Myanmar Times in 2000 and was arrested four years later on censorship charges before his release in 2013. Two years later, he established Frontier as a weekly magazine. When I first started Frontier, I was very, very emotional because the imprisonment basically changed my life and I became a lot more serious in terms of publishing a, a, a publication. With Frontier, we started as a very small uh, publication and um, uh, the rules are different, the team uh, is different and we wanted to cover this uh, 2015 elections. That was my immediate mission, you know, because knowing that if we do a good job uh, covering the elections, and we will, our reach is going to be a lot better and faster, right, uh, to gain the audience. So that was that was the goal to to cover uh, uh, 2015 elections. Despite some press freedom challenges in the reform years, including under the NLD. Frontier was able to report relatively freely before the coup took place, but the situation has now drastically changed. Journalists are being targeted by the hunter, with dozens having been arrested, and some outlets ordered closed, although most are still operating from secure locations. We, we are in, in a really tough uh, situation uh, to, to, to operate, and, and it, it's been very difficult days and nights uh, for, for every publisher and, and the journalists on the ground covering the, 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 the protests uh, in the streets. They're not only risking the imprisonment, uh, they also, you know, like three or four of uh, our uh, team members, uh, some people get sh- shot by the slingshots, from from the uh, from the military supporters, um, and some some of them got hit by the um, the tear gas, and and one of them got shot by the rubber bullet in the head. Luckily, he was wearing the the helmet, but still, you know, this um, it was quite quite a. Luckily, those are the, the the minor injuries that we have faced so far. Uh, we've been quite lucky uh, in that way. We uh, Everyone is safe at, at, as of today. As an indication of the dangers reporters on the ground are facing, shortly after our interview with Sonny took place, a Frontier reporter covering the protests in Mandalay was shot in the hand. In a dispatch written shortly after the incident took place, the reporter wrote, I haven't given up. I'm typing this now with my good hand, which I also use to make phone calls to get information. As soon as I can, I'll be back out there. Another journalist who's covered the protests on the ground and who requested anonymity said it's been extremely challenging work, but there has also been a huge level of support for journalists from the general public. Especially at this time, especially young people, they came to understand uh, the role of the media, that it is necessary. It is always working on on presenting uh, all the news, all the truth uh, about the, the country. At the time... The role of the media, the reputation of the media is like shining again. We have been receiving free food, drinks from all the houses and, uh, and, uh, and, and, and protesters when we are uh, out there in the street. You know, whenever they see a camera with us, whenever they see a press car, you know, they always give protection. We felt safe among the protesters. We felt safe among the people you know we were invited to their house and they offer food they they all they arrange a space so that we can we can keep filming keep taking photos you know and and also i realized that more and more people really like to uh talk to us you know they wanted to share their their stories which is really different from from the previous time because all the journalists if we wear like if we wear press helmet or press vest uh, we are targeted by the military the people are now giving protection to us so it's really getting better and i can feel the how to say loving kindness from people uh to our journalist community within days of the coup widespread protests against the military also sprouted up across the country Some of the earliest demonstrations were started by the country's labour workers and have since expanded to include people from all walks of life. They've happened almost every day since and have been witnessed in the country's far north, in the foothills of the Himalayas, all the way to the southerly towns on the cusp of the Andaman Sea in the south and many more in between. As well as labour movements have led the protests 
Many of those who have been at the forefront of the demonstrations in Myanmar have been young people, particularly those from the country's Generation Z demographic. Human rights defender Tinza Shun Le Yi has been one of those heavily involved in the protest movement. Since before the coup, uh, we've been kind of organizing uh, a campaign and protest against the constitution, against all the un- unjust laws in the country uh, that violate like, human rights, especially freedom of expression. We've been always under scrutiny by the security forces, by the government since a long time ago. So, so after the coup is pretty much clear for, for us that we have to keep up the momentum. And at the same time, you know, after the protest and after uh, the killings by the security forces, we felt like we are joined by many more activists. So many young people turn out to be protester and activists. So we got more more people joining the movement. Many young students being jailed for their protest against the current uh, political situation. And so, so what we are saying is to abolish all sort of um, unjust laws that uh, instill the dictatorship. For Shun Lei and others, these protests go further than just overthrowing the military, but ending all forms of authoritarianism in Myanmar. Yeah, that's, that's the, something that we wanted to see. Uh, the, the kind of unity against all forms of injustices happening in the country, regardless of, you know, who being oppressed or what, what, you, or what ethnicity or race or religion. So that's that sort of thing that we want to see. I I feel like we're going forward to that sort of state. Um, we are trying so hard to fight back the ideologies, especially the nationalist, extreme nationalist ideology, um, amends our general public. Um, you know, uh, over the minorities. And it's pretty huge, it's deep rooted. So um, we never thought that it would be super quick and it would be super easy. And, uh, you know, it's like country talking about the Rohingya atrocity and the ethnic minorities um, situation. But, um, but now, now it's spreading, we become, um, we're showing how we should stand in solidarity with the oppressed. If we want others also to stay in solidarity with, uh, with the injustice that we are witnessing. So that's how I feel is, is the, the, the number of people like us are growing, growing every day. One of the most effective tools in the anti-military campaign has been the civil disobedience movement, started by medical staff on February 2, one day after the coup. The CDM, as it's popularly known, has called on civil servant workers from a range of government ministries not to report to work as part of efforts to cripple both the administration and the economy and make the country ungovernable for the junta. We spoke to a doctor who's been involved in the CDM since the very beginning and who requested anonymity for his safety. We spoke to him through a translator and have used a voice actor to read out his comment. This civil disobedience movement means civil disobedience against the government, so they cannot function anymore. This is the concept of our revolution. By doing CDM, the government cannot do anything, they cannot operate anything without our cooperation, and we can see it as very effective. However, the CDM has also faced major challenges, the doctor said. This includes access to finances. After all, those involved in the movement cannot collect their salaries, as well as the fact that many doctors have felt guilty for not providing much-needed treatment to the general public. Members of the CDM, especially doctors, have also been heavily targeted by security forces. But there are also efforts to overcome these difficulties. Doctors involved in the movement are helping to raise funds inside the country for those involved in the campaign, while they've also established a volunteer group to provide health care to the general public, especially those injured in the protests. The CDM campaign is having a large degree of success. Although it's hard to put an estimate on how many civil servants have joined the movement, it's worth noting that the military junta does not have control of many of the country's crucial services, including banks, railways and the health sector. There's also another way to measure the campaign's success, the doctor said. We can measure its success by the amount of oppression the military is doing. They are oppressing a lot of people, even those who have donated a little amount of money to the movement. So you can see how successful our movement is from this. Whatever challenges they're facing, he said those involved in the CDM will continue fighting until the military is overthrown. It's difficult to predict how long this will take, but those involved in the CDM have decided they will continue doing it until the end. We've already made plans for how we will keep going. The Spring Revolution must be the last revolution to end the military rule. Another weapon in the resistant movement's arsenal is the establishment of a parallel government, in the form of the National Unity Government, which was formally announced in mid-April. The NUG was established under the committee representing the Pudang Su Lutor, 
which is the national parliament, and which itself was founded shortly after the coup. The NUG aims to gain international recognition as the government of Myanmar, and although it's mainly comprised of members of the NLD, it is not solely the domain of the party, an indication that it may be more willing to listen to minority voices. Its vice president, for example, was announced as Duwa Lashila, a member of the Kachin National Consultative Council, while its cabinet also comprises members of other parties representing ethnic minority interests. The NUG has also said it plans to link up with the country's ethnic armed groups to establish a federal army that it hopes can defeat the Tatmadaw militarily. The logistics of such an army, however, remain unknown. Dr Sasa is the NUG's Minister for International Cooperation, and he spoke to APHR before the NUG was formed, and was referring to the government as the CRPH. I'm representing CRPH, and uh, they are elected by the people of Myanmar for the people of Myanmar. 2020, November 8, elections, 36 million voters went to the vote, and they vote for the CRPH, elected them as their representative. So it, they are, they are, the people have given the mandate to CRPH, and the people voice are with CRPH. International community must respect the will of the people of Myanmar, which was expressed on 8th of November 2020. That means that uh, the people of Myanmar democratically elected is more than 400 member of parliament to represent them. So all the free world, democratic world, should respect the will of the people of Myanmar. Right now, all those 400 members of parliament are in the high or in the round because they are subjected by guns fighting by the bullets. In that situation, we are calling on international community. All the parliaments around the world who are elected by their own people should hear the voice of the people of Myanmar who have elected their representative on 8th of November 2020. Nor Susanna Lala So was announced as the Minister for Women, Youth and Children's Affairs under the National Unity Government. At an APHR organised press conference, she spoke about the desires of a new government. The people of Myanmar said, enough is enough, under military for more than seven decades, and we will choose death instead of living under the military, under the dictatorship. That's why every day, the young people, women, children, they give their lives for the democracy. I strongly believe that this is a strong unity among the people of Myanmar and their determination for the better future with justice. We hold the country together. We and the people are capable of building a strong nation, become a good neighbor, and establish and maintain stability in the country and for the ASEAN region with the people's power. Another major player in all of this are the country's myriad ethnic armed groups. Many have been involved in fighting with the Tatmadaw in the last few months. In particular, the Kachin Independence Army and the Karen National Union have seen intense battles in recent weeks, while there have also been civilian uprising in the country's north, notably in Sagaing region and Chin State. Signatories of the nationwide ceasefire agreement which was penned in 2015, have this week said they will begin reaching out to non-signatories in order to discuss a more organised resistance against the Tatmadaw. An official from the Restoration Council for Shan State, or ICSS, said they would approach the KIA and the KNU, as well as groups such as the United Wa State Army, the most powerful EAO, the Ta'ang National Liberation Army, the Myanmar National Democratic Alliance Army, and the Arakan Army, among others. It remains to be seen how unified these various groups can become, particularly given they have their own set of demands and grievances. But a truly united front against the Tatmadaw would further stretch their resources and play a major role in any efforts to topple the regime. In the next episode, we'll look at what measures the international community can take to help the efforts on the ground. We'll look at Myanmar's international relations, both in the pre- and post-coup environment, to understand how governments around the world can step up and affect meaningful change in the country. We'll look at those dynamics both within the Asia region as well as further afield. Thanks for listening. This episode of Myanmar, Anatomy of a Coup, was written and produced by me, Oliver Slow. 
with editorial input from Elise T.A. Dagusset. Thanks also to Fiona Cervez. For those who would like to support the pro-democracy movement in Myanmar, you can contribute by visiting isupportmyanmar.com. You can also donate to independent media outlets such as Frontier Myanmar and Myanmar Now. Links to these pages can be found in the show notes. APHR's work is supported by the Swedish International Development Cooperation Agency, or SIDA, the Norwegian Ministry of Foreign Affairs, and the Open Societies Foundation. This series is part of APHR's new podcast channel, Advocate, which addresses some of the most important human rights developments in Southeast Asia. Please listen, share, subscribe and review wherever you get your podcast. Future episodes of this podcast series will be available in the next few weeks. And for more information about APHR's work, please visit our website, asianmp.org. Thanks for listening.